Hello, uh, my name is Dave Willett. I'm a, a surgeon with an interest in rhinoplasty and training skills. This is the rhinoplasty model developed with Adam Rooley to provide three-dimensional familiarity with anatomical structures and to help teach rhinoplasty skills through simulated surgery. The head is weighted to provide stability and there is an insert which can be obtained separately. The insert is composed of three separate materials which simulate bone, cartilage and the soft tissue envelope. The thermolabile cartilage can be altered with a hot air blower to provide an infinite number of nasal deformities upon which surgery can be simulated. Anatomical terms commonly used are radix at the level of the supratarsal fold, nasofrontal angle at junction of forehead and nasal dorsum, nasal dorsum, supratip break, tip defining points, columella labial angle, stomion, menton. Let's analyse this nose and discuss possible changes as we would with a patient. Typical proportions of a Caucasian female are examined here. On an anterior view, the nasal length from the radix to the tip defining points is a little long, one millimetre longer than the stomion to menton. There is a deviation of the tip to the right. The width of the bony base should be 75% to 80% of the intercanthal distance and is a little wide in this case. The width of the alar base is satisfactory about the same width as the intercanthal distance. The basal view of the columella and the outline of the nasal base should form an equilateral triangle. This tip is rounded and ill-defined. The nasofrontal angle lies between the upper eyelash and supratarsal fold, which is OK. The nasal dorsum is high for a woman. There's hardly any supratip break. The tip projects 3 mm, more than two-thirds of the ideal nasal length. In keeping with this, more than 50 to 60% projects beyond a line dropped to the most projecting part of the upper lip. Tip rotation, that is the angle of the nostril with the horizontal, is satisfactory at 95 degrees. But the columella labial angle is 20 degrees and arguably should be more like 45 degrees. Let's assume that the discussed ideals are to be achieved. Sequencing the surgical steps improves control and predictability to soft tissue elevation, cephalic alar trim, dorsum modification, medial osteotomies, septoplasty, spreader grafts, final tip shaping, lateral osteotomies. The model is amenable to both open and closed rhinoplasty. But for the purpose of video recording, we are going to do this as an open procedure. And we are also going to lift the soft tissue envelope off the nose to reveal the cartilages underneath. We're going to elevate the soft tissue and periosteum here, just cutting through the periosteum. That's 7 to 8 millimetres laterally, so preserving support to the periosteum and to the bone. The open approach shows an increased intercrural angle of greater than 30 degrees and widened domes of greater than 4 millimetres. In addition, the mid-septum deviates to the left. In performing an alar cephalic trim, we need to define and preserve the tip defining points. We need to preserve at least 6 mm of the alar cartilage. We don't need to go further than 12 mm laterally in this particular instance. We're going to take some of the intermediate cruria as well in order to bring the tip defining points together. In life, we would preserve the underlying mucoperichondrium. Dorsum reduction would begin normally with sub-mucoperichondrial tunnels bilaterally. 
The osseous dorsum is reduced next, using a rasp on an oblique basis. Small reductions of 3 mm or more can be performed by rasping alone. The reason for doing it obliquely is to avoid disruption of the attachment of the upper lateral cartilage to the underside of the nasal bones. Next, we divide the upper laterals from the septum by sharp dissection. This effectively leaves a cartilaginous dorsum in three sections. Initially, we want just to reduce the central portion alone and to avoid reducing the upper laterals unless absolutely necessary, to avoid a sharp dorsum and to avoid a later inverted V deformity. Take the merest, smallest piece of this each side. Next we're going to perform superior medial oblique osteotomies. We are still going to preserve our support of the nasal vault because we are not doing the lateral osteotomies yet. This will avoid disrupting our spreader grafts later on. We are heading towards the inner canthus but not beyond. We're now doing a septoplasty, preserving dorsal and caudal struts of 10 mm. This is for graft material. The caudal septum is attached to the maxillary spine in the midline, so we just need to direct attention to straightening this septum to the dorsum. See how there is a deviation to the left there, which we will need to straighten with some spreader grafts. To weaken it a bit further, we need to do 50% cuts inferiorly. 50% through the underside to the midpoints just to weaken this dorsum so that we can buttress and straighten it with the spreader grafts. About 5mm in width and ideally 30mm long. These are our two spreader grafts so put them below the level of the septal plane and secure these initially with needles and PDS sutures. We now have a septum that is considerably straighter. We're going to attach the upper laterals to this, reattach them to the septum in the upper three quarters to prevent inferomedial migration of the upper laterals, but not to attach in the lower quarter so as to preserve the normal flaring that takes place in the caudal portions. We are now going to adjust the domes relative to each other and bring the junction of the medial crura and intermediate crura together with a medial crural fixation suture. Not only does this equalize the heights of the domes, but also unifies the medial crura, making them less likely to move with subsequent sutures. We would like a columella strut to control the columella labial angle here. So we need to carve that from the septal graft that we took. We are producing a gently curved graft at least 3 mm wide. We have to sculpt this to how we want our strut. We're making a little pocket in which to insert the strut almost to the nasal spine, not to it, just short of it.
We put temporary needles through to hold the strut in position. Not only can the strut alter the columella labial angle, but also provide stability to the columella and increase tip projection if necessary. Once we are happy with the position, we can slide the medial crura laterally so we can place sutures. We use the penetration points of the needles as a guide as to where we're going to put the sutures. We're going to encircle the needles with the suture needle. The suture attaches to the medial crura and the strut. The suture goes through the strut just once, being tied anterior to it. We're going to slip the needles out so that we can secure the columella strut completely. We're just going to shave a little excess of the columella strut off. We want to narrow the domes with some domal sutures, which are going to be put 2mm to 3mm either side of the tip defining points, which are already marked. Go through the cartilage, not through the mucopericondrium on the other side. We want to leave the knots on the medial aspect, so that they don't deform lateral crura. It's important that we don't over tighten these. 2mm to 3mm either side of the desired tip defining point because we can move the tip defining point if necessary. We are happy with this particular tip defining point. We don't want to borrow from the lateral crura. We have left one suture long on each side because frequently there is a bit of distortion in that the domes aren't quite the same height and also we may want to bring the domes together. Ideally to about 5mm to 6mm. Currently they are exactly on 6mm. We will just suture those together and cut that one short. It's usually desirable to create a supra tip break, particularly in females, and we need to get the tip defining points 5mm to 8mm higher than the septal angle. The thicker the skin, the greater that distance should be. Here it's about 6 to 7mm. The skin here is reasonably thick. Turning to the lateral osteotomies, these are to be performed in this case externally. Make a single stab incision through the skin alone, into which you're going to introduce an osteotome. We're going to bring this up to within a centimetre of the dorsum and then sweep it down subperiosteally in order that we can displace the angular artery and avoid its damage during the osteotomies. Starting at the most stable part of the bone in the middle, we go down to the piriform aperture and up to the dorsum. We want to present an angle to the osteotome rather than it being perpendicular because that provides more cutting and less transmitted force. And we will make a further incision between the inner canthus and the dorsum of the nose. We then join up with our medial superior oblique osteotomies. Listening for a change in the sound, we're moving two millimeters at a time until we've got a series of perforations to the dorsum of the nose. Having performed the lateral osteotomies with digital pressure, Infracture the bones both to reduce the wide bony base and close the open roof.
It must be said that the rhinoplasty model is not a substitute for supervised surgical training in the operating room with an experienced mentor, but it is felt to play a useful role in providing an opportunity to learn and practice rhinoplasty skills through simulated surgery in an unhurried environment outside the operating room.